Our next speaker uh, comes to us from New York City. And as I understand it, specifically requested an introduction on the order that is about to happen. Uh, so a funny story about him is that his family actually comes from the ocean. Uh, amphibious, right? Uh, and when they got to Ellis Island and they emigrated to the United States, it was actually really uncomfortable because it was the first time they had stepped foot. And they were like, land? Ow. Uh, um, this, this next talk is going to be as fun, you know, as that uh, pun was. Uh, Trevor Landau from Condé Nast, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up. Thanks a lot. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Trevor Landau, and this talks about functional programming, uh, specifically in JavaScript. Uh, I don't want to walk out, so before he leaves, uh, come back. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, everyone's been talking about, uh, or a lot of the speakers have been saying what their favorite tags are. My favorite tag is the son tag. <laughs> uh, anyway, jokes aside. Um, so the reason I want to talk about this, because about a year and a half ago, um, I, I really started to get into functional programming. And I'd been doing a bit of it in my JavaScript, but not really realizing I was actually doing functional programming. Um, I've been doing JavaScript for about four years now. And um, before that, I was doing PHP and uh, a little bit of .NET, uh, mostly through school. And then my first job had, uh, was mostly PHP. And in those programming languages, um, or at least at the time, they didn't really have the idea of functional programming. And during my work day, I frequently have people asking me about functional programming because I talk about it a lot. And I see in their code that it's very much more imperative style or uh, you know, levels of object-oriented programming on that. And so when I talk to them and I try to show them the way, um, how I think about it, uh, they're really, they're really pleased by how it is, and they can, they can reduce their code. And so that's why I came up with this, um, whatever the word for it is, uh, write less, do more. That's my hook. I just made, I just made that up. And so uh, not to conflict with jQuery, there's no period. Um, so the form of this talk is all based around code. There's going to be a ton of code. Please bear with me. Um, don't try to understand all of it right away if you're not really familiar with functional programming. Uh, I will try my best. Um, I've, like I said, I've had about a year and a half of experience really getting into functional programming now. And it's not always easy for me to convey uh, how I can see it and uh, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so you're obviously all here. There's a lot of big crowd here and are very interested in it. So I'm hoping that most of you are new to it and I can convert you into functional programmers. Though with JavaScript, don't totally give up the idea of using the prototype because it's still quite useful. Um, but this whole talk will be pretty much all functional programming and not really using any sort of those object-oriented ideas. So in this talk, there's going to be things that are disallowed, and that is uh, mutation and for uh, looping constructs, like for, while, uh, et cetera. So Brendan Eich himself even says that the best parts of JavaScript um, came from Scheme, which is a Lisp-like language uh, that is a functional language itself. So let's get started by uh, you know, looking at some code. Um, so here's my editor's OK size. For everyone, I can bump it up. We need more. So the, we're going to go through a bunch of these files. They're all split up like this, and we'll step through some of the code uh, and discuss it. So oh, that looks good. So this is how I usually see um, functional style programming being done. And it is a functional style because we're passing a function around. In this case, it's a, uh, an anonymous function that we pass to, uh, to get all the items out of this. Uh, from all the P, the P tags with class quote, we're going to get the text out of it, and we're going to store in some items uh, array. And in that items array, we're mutating it every time by adding some value to it. So every time I iterate through it, there's going to be a new value added to it, and it's beyond the, the scope of si outside this function. In functional programming, we want to tran I like to think of it as transforming data. So when I see things like this, uh, this is actually just two different examples. So there's a, we're going to be doubling numbers. And we can either have a way uh, we're going to iterate over it with a for loop. And we're going to 
change the value at that specific spot, or we're going to push it to another, uh, another array. And, and I see this as doing it completely wrong because JavaScript has way better constructs to do this, or functions, per se. Um, so we're going to go through a couple terms, because so, um, I'll probably use them throughout the talk, just make sure you understand them. Um, I like to call both of these styles of uh, 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 data structures as collections. So they just hold related data. Uh, so that's just a regular object literal and just a regular array. And I'll probably refer to them as those sometimes, um, but also as collections or arrays. Uh, so they are synonymous for this talk. Uh, another term is function arity. And that just means how many parameters a function can accept. So in the case of this function jump, it accepts the value a, and that is of arity 1. Uh, and we have jog, which has a and b, arity 2, and run has 3, arity 3. It's pretty simple, but the name is uh, kind of odd. Oops. So uh, another term we want to have under our belts is pure um, functions being pure and referential transparency which just sounds cool, but not that confusing. So at the beginning here, we have this uh, append function, which just adds a value to some array that we are given. Um, and we can return uh, a new array through concat. Concat will, any, for any value you give, you give to concat, it's going to return a brand new array with the original array's values and then uh, the new value you give it at the end of it. So we create a value array, uh, a variable array with one, and we're going to get a new one um, set to variable x uh, when we give it the value 2. So on this line, we'll log array. And we see that is unchanged. And on the next slide, or on the next line, uh, we have x, which is now has our new value that we appended to it. And that's, wh that's what we like to call a pure function uh, and referential transparency, because the value uh, that we gave in um, for any value we give in, we get the same exact output. So any new array I give it, I'm going to get always get two, and that original array will not be mutated. And this is where it goes wrong. When we have append mutate, we're going to, that should have been push, sorry about that. So we have append mutate, which pushes a new value onto it, uh, and we don't get a new value, act we don't actually don't get a new value out of it. So when we do log our value x, it's actually the same thing that we gave it originally. Oops, oh, that worked. Um, another concept we're going to talk about is immutability and, um, and its importance. Uh, and JavaScript has a little bit of this, not very much. And uh, strings are a classic case of that. If I set the variable x to I love functional programming, and then I check that value, compare it against x plus some exclamation marks, they are obviously not the same. Uh, here's another example of uh, using immutability. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, we'll be using uh, the, the library underscore uh, throughout this talk to add uh, additional functional uh, um, functions to our, our repertoire. So frequently I see, uh, or I, including myself in some, in some cases, we would modify this original object uh, with some value. So we'll just call it foo, and we give it the, a string one. Um, however, when you're doing functional programming, it's better to keep safe with these because who, you don't know who is using these, uh, uh, these, this, this object that is totally passed around by reference. So if I pass it to any function, anyone can mess with it, and somewhere else where that's being used as well is going to get changed. And that's where bugs occur, and they're very difficult to track without using debugging techniques. Uh, so there's a few ways you can use underscore to keep your values ap appearing immutable. Um, uh, so there's, there's clone, which just copies every single key over. Um, and we've seen extend through jQuery for the years, and um, a lot of libraries have something like this. Uh, and so um, the, the, there's a little bit of a problem with extend in that the very first object must, uh, the very first parameter must be the one that the rest of the parameters are going to get copied onto. So I'm going to feed it a plain object literal. I'm going to pass in planet, which will then copy those values over, and then the values I want to add onto it. Uh, but a cleaner way is to use defaults, which will not override any values that are already set. Um, so I, I said we shouldn't be mutating things, but there is, I think, is, is a, a nice use case is when we have 
mutation inside a function. So this is just a basic um, selection sort in which I actually am doing some uh, mutable changes here. Oh no, some of them got cut off. Apologize for that. There was uh, some actual setting of values here, so bear with me. Um, but instead of actually uh, sorting the array that was given to me, I can simply get the value from concat, uh, get a new array, the exact same copy, um, just by calling array concat, and we can mutate that, and then return that array, which will give us that referential transparency. Uh, next, we have uh, recursion, is another, uh, another term we're gonna use. And um, this is an important one in functional programming because we don't have looping constructs, or typically don't have looping constructs, depends on the language you choose. Uh, so this is Fibonacci, you know, the, the classic. Um, the, very, the most important part um, that, we have, that you have in recursion is this base case. And that is similar to as if you were doing a for loop where we had something like this and then i is less than some array's length. So that middle part is uh, basically synonymous with as a base case. Um, so we'll quickly walk through this. And there's a better example after this one, but uh, this is more simple to understand. Um, through recursion, we're just gonna call ourselves. So when we call this, func uh, when we call this function, Fibonacci, with the value 20, it's gonna hit this first line. We're gonna check, is, this, is n less than two? If it is, then we're gonna return one, just because that's how Fibonacci works. Otherwise, we're going to call Fibonacci again with n minus two and add that to Fib uh, another call to Fibonacci with n minus one. And that's just the logic for Fibonacci. Don't worry about getting into to the details. So every time we call Fibonacci, we're decreasing the number and, uh, and additionally holding it in the stack frame. They're going to be added together until all these calls get resolved to n, uh, n less than two and they all will backfire. And we'll see in, I think, the next example. Um, sorry, it's the one after this, but this is a good one too. So this is a... Um, a, an implementation of the for each function that's available in JavaScript on arrays. Um, it's just the one I chose to go with um, because it's functional. And there's a lot of important concepts in here. So we want to start out by caching the array length. And then I have this inner function that I call each. And this is basically my, my way of looping. Uh, we want to start out at zero because that's just how this for each works. Um, so when we call each, the internal each, that is. We're gonna, we need to return that value because at some point, each is going to resolve recursively and return us the grand total value at the end. Uh, well, actually, in the case of each, we don't return values, but uh, it's just safe to do that way. So each takes i, which is, like I said before, that middle area inside a for loop. And we're gonna check our base case. Is i greater than l, which is our array length? If it is, then we're, we're done. That's the end. Otherwise, we're going to call our function um, with the given context, but that's just how the signature and array is, and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, and it, this is, like I said, this matches the same exact function signature that uh, JavaScript has for, for each. So we take the value that we find at the, uh, array, uh, the array indice, uh, give the index as well, and the original array. I don't know why JavaScript does that, but it does. So we know we're still good. We haven't exited our case. We haven't exceeded the length of the array. So we increment i plus one. And we come around again, and it's just gonna keep on going until we uh, exceed the length of the array. Uh, so, so the next one is uh, another concept we, that we saw earlier with, in Corey's talk, uh, was returning functions. And this is an incredibly useful function that I use all the time. Uh, it's, it's the property function. You can find it in underscore and, and low dash, which are uh, similar libraries. Uh, so the idea is we want to return some function and maintain uh, some scoped va values. So in this case, uh, property has an arity one in which it accepts some property. And then we return a function that calls, an ob uh, calls the, the, the key to the object itself. So as you can see on this line here, I, I create a new variable called get name and call property and pass it the key name or property name. And now I can call get name as many times as I please and get the correct value. So I have the now I have the name John here. And that 
would actually get us the correct answer. And now I can reuse this as many times as I want. Another important concept of functional programming, that it's, uh, it's not opinionated onto exactly what uh, um, any actual business logic has. Uh, another important concept is the arguments uh, object, and it's an array-like object that has a length property and you can access it by indices. So this is just for example, so you can understand what the arguments object is. And uh, so arguments, as I said, is an array-like uh, object and you can access each um, value that's specified here. So even if there were more passed in to obtain enlightenment, so if I did that, arguments two would actually be available. Um, this makes it very powerful and you'll, and you'll see exactly why soon. Um, another, another great uh, tool to use when you're doing functional style programming is using slice uh, directly off the array prototype. And this is where call is important. And you use it in tandem with arguments frequently. So as I said, arguments is an array-like object. So what do we actually want access to? all the methods that, or maybe we need access, uh, uh, do something with these arguments. Maybe we don't need all of them. Uh, or maybe we have a, a, a long number of arguments that we don't even uh, know what we're gonna do, do, deal with yet. So we can call um, slice.call and just pass the arguments and that then becomes an array. And an another trick to use if you don't want to use call uh, is to use the call function that's directly on the uh, function con constructor. And then you can call bind on that and pass it slice, and then you can call slice without having to do the, uh, the whole song and dance with uh, dot call. Uh, and, and frequently used is uh, slice arguments and some number at the end to get to the tail call, uh, the, or the rest of the values, because maybe you care about the first ones. We're gonna see a lot of this um, later. Um, similar to call, we have apply. And now this is a uh, not a very good example for, in terms of um, realism, but it, 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 does, it does work um, for helping you understand. So we have this function add. We check if arguments.length is not present. And if there's only one, we can just return A because there's nothing to add. And otherwise, we're going to return A plus B. So as you can see from these two calls at the end to it are identical. So it's going to what I like to call spreading the values across uh, um, as arguments, so one and two in an array will then get spread across and we'll call it as if you called it uh, as you see on line 11 here. Uh, so here's a better example of how you might use it. Uh, in this block here, 10 through 18, uh, this is the more imperative way you might use add many. So we don't know how many arguments we're going to take if we want to add a ton of them. Uh, we're going to keep around the original add function because we can just make reuse of that. But we're going to iterate over it normally like we would over an array. But the logic is kind of weird. So we, ca we have to cache the how many arguments are available. Um, we have our base case, of course. And we're going to increment by two because we're doing A and B uh, many times. And then we have to have some accumulator that adds these values together. However, we can write this much more concisely, though if you're not used to functional style programming, it might look <laughs> a little um, complicated. So in add many, the recursive version, um, we actually don't really have any logic except for line 21 that says, Is there, if there's less than three arguments, just call add regularly. So on line 22, we want to return a call to add, give it the first value, and then we're going to call add many again and spread the remainder of the arguments across. Um, underscore dot rest is a function from underscore obviously that will take, uh, just remove the very first value from the array. So a realized version of this looks just like this on line 29 in which it's going to call add one and one and then add one to that and add one to that. So we do in fact get uh, the number four. Uh, to explain that a little bit better, um, it's important to recognize apply, again, uh, to reiterate, it's going to spread those values across uh, the argument calls. And because this function checks when there's less than three arguments, which eventually comes at the very end of the realized version, uh, we will get our calls back into it. 
Um, and here's another use of, of apply. It's a quick example. Um, the, the function flatten, which will take our arrays, uh, any 2D array, and just flatten them into a single one. And it's as simple as calling uh, concat, uh, this underscore concat ref is reference to uh, the array prototype concat. We give it an, a new array, uh, array to use as the context, which will be the placement of these new values, and just pass as, as, as many values as we want. We have no idea how many arrays there could be. It could literally be oops, that. And all of them will then, in fact, get flattened in. I'm going to go a little bit fast because I do have a demo, uh, and I don't want to miss that. Um, so here's um, native, uh, another native um, function bind that we saw a little bit before. And basically, this allows us to bind some context to um, a, a given function and, uh, and some n number of values that it will use first. And it's super basic, we can just make a new info and warn console logger that will always be prepended with info and or warn. Um, and this is basically what the native bind looks like under the hood. Uh, we're going to chop off the first two values because fn and context are the only ones we really care about initially. Uh, and then we're going to return a bound function that spreads those values across with any original given one, if any original given values. And I'll explain that again. So remember at the inf on line five here, we're going to cache the original arguments given. Um, that are the remainder of the call. So in the case of, oops, in the case of this one, uh, we give it just warn, the string warn. So we have warn here. That's only gonna, that's gonna be, that will be the only argument in this array here. So args is equivalent to warn. Um, and bind is also useful in other ways, um, such as preserving the context for some function. So let's just imagine, um, I want to iterate over some values to make this pony fly. But in order for it to fly, it needs access to how much it weighs. So if it weighs a lot, it's not going to go as high. There's no actual logic for that here. But, um, so if I want to iterate over these values and just pass it, the fly function, it's going to fail because we lose the context. So instead, we can actually bind Ulysses the pony to the fly function, in which case this is preserved. Um, and this is um, probably one of the most important functions that I use quite frequently in JavaScript, and it's reduce. And to reduce something is to basically go over a list of arguments, iterate over them, and return a single value. So this is what I would imagine the assign uh, function will look like from ES6. So let's just start from the beginning. Uh, so we're going to check if there's, any less, if there's less than two arguments. If there is, then we're just going to return the destination because there's nothing to copy onto. And the destination is the, uh, is, so this is like, sorry, uh, assign is the same as like ex extend, basically. So we're going to start on line seven here. And we're going to call rest on. Uh, on the arguments value. So uh, underscore will actually convert it to an array for you, which is quite handy. And this will go over the remainder of the arguments, which is uh, n number of values, um, hopefully objects, or it will probably blow up. So the function that we give to it, this destination object, is actually an accumulator, uh, which is, in this case, is the same value that we passed in. And the second parameter here to reduce is that accumulator. So we, we could give it anything, really. We could give it a number, we could give it an array, or anything. And, within, and inside this uh, reducing uh, action, we're going to just do a regular var p property inside um, our source value, which is going to be another object in this case. And once we copy all those values onto it, we're going to return our accumulator again, which then is still destination. So if we did not return destination, so we return the value one, the second time we iterate over this, destination will then become the value one. And the, there's a small example down here, uh, as we saw, just the same as extend. Uh, but like I said, I need to move a little bit faster here. Um, so here's the implementation of reduce. And again, it's a uh, no loops, just recursion. 
So we take an array, a function, and an initializer. Uh, if there is no initializer, then we're just going to use the first value that's found inside the array. Otherwise, we will use the initializer. And here's the most important part. This is the recursive part, in which case we have our base case. Has our index exceeded the length of our array? Otherwise, we're going to set a next variable, which calls the function, and this is the signature that matches JavaScript again. And we're going to cache that value in next, and then we'll pass that along, and that is that accumulator value that we saw before. So like I said, if this returned one, uh, it's going to pass in that value one. Um, I am just going to skip some of these. I apologize, but time. Um, so this is probably my uh, second most used function in when, I type, uh, when I'm doing functional style programming. And this is the function map. And this is where I originally uh, realized that there's a lot more power to functional programming. Uh, most frequently, if I do see people use map, it is something like this, where you, um, you have a list of people, and you map over it, and you return some name. And you can pass it any function. And sometimes I, people will miss that, too. Um, as, and we'll see a better way to do this uh, to get properties out a little bit later. So in here, we just pass the JSON stringify function, and we can get a serialized version if we wanted to as well. Oops. Um, and here's the implementation. We're actually going to make use of reduce. Um, this is what makes functional programming so powerful. Very frequently, you'll find yourself just saying, I have this other function. Or when you're writing a function, you'll find yourself making two, because it will work with the, uh, another one in tandem, and you can have uh, really great power out of that. And we're writing less. So we're going to take reduce, and we're going to iterate over the array that's given, and start a new accumulator as a new array. And then we're just going to concatenate the function call that we gave with the context, just to match the signature of uh, JavaScript again. And it's just going to keep looping around until it's all done. Super simple, and we don't have to do any extra testing in terms of uh, on reduce, because we know it already works. Concat's native, it already works. So we just need to make sure in our test that uh, you know, we get this transformed uh, values. Uh, and here's a qu quick example on how we can might maybe use map. Um, I like to do it this way. Uh, so I created this function called times, and I've used array apply and pass it the context of null and some length of an array, we can actually get a, uh, an array that's full of undefines, which I know sounds kind of silly. But we can make use of this index that's in there. And now we have an array that's full of uh, increasing numbers. So once we have that, we can call times, pass this make page URL, which just makes some strings. And the map on that dollar get. And now we can, uh, however many times we need to make a call to maybe get uh, a number of pages we have them all in a list of promises that we can resolve uh, separately. And again, so we wrote a new function times and make page URL, and that was it. We didn't have to worry about actually generating this whole list. So this is what I like, uh, we like to call uh, code as data. And we'll see more, as that, more of that. Um, the next, next function that's very important uh, is filter. And so in this, we just basically want to say, I only want the even values, and we pass some predicate to it. Uh, in this case, we're just going to use the modulus operator to figure out if there is, uh, if, the va if the value is even. And so we have our values, and we filter it, and pass it as even, and from it we get back two. And here again is an implementation where, again, we make use of reduce, and we're going to iterate over an array, and give it an uh, initial accumulator of a new array. And during the, the iteration process, we're going to see if that value already exists inside the array, and then uh, either concat onto it or not. And uh, because it's a predicate, we can make use of a ternary here. And uh, that's going to return a true or false value. And if it is true, then just tack the value back onto it. Oops, sorry, I'm, just, I'm going to skip this one because I'm running low in time. Uh, some other useful functions that I don't really see people use all are sum is one of them. And sum is going to return a truthy or falsy value based on some predicate given, uh, as we can see here. So we have a list of people. And we want to figure out maybe we want this many. How do we know what, how many people are under the age of 30 or greater or equal to 30? Uh, 
And it's just as simple as passing a function that says that. In this case, we have false and true. And the implementation of this is super simple. We can make use of filter. All we have to do is ensure that there's at least one value remaining inside this array. So we're going to pass uh, our function to filter, compare the length that's returned from it, and just say greater than zero. Additionally, um, I, this is the way I find myself using it the most, is inside if statements. And we can say, we need to do some code only if this statement is true. But rather than checking each individual value or writing some new function, you can just have a predicate that tests that, which you probably already have inside your code anyway, and just pass it right to it. And the alternative, uh, the, the opposite of that is every, which makes sure every single value is true. So in this case, is everyone under the age of 30 or are they greater, less than or equal to? And in this case, it's true. Again, the implementation is incredibly, incredibly simple. We can use filter again, and we just need to make sure they are the exact same length because the filtered values will be full of trues. Um, or sorry, uh, will only return if those uh, the predicate returns true, and therefore the lengths are, would have to be the same. Again, my usage, is it, my usage of it is quite the same when I use it inside if statements. Um, so this is the way I, I mostly will get properties out. I will just have people.map and pass it the underscore dot property with the given key that we saw before, which returns a new function and will call on each object, uh, call the function for each object, which will in turn give us Trevor, Ryan, Josh, and Paul. Um, but there's actually an easier way to do this in, in, uh, in JavaScript, or sorry, with underscore, uh, where we can just pass the people array and pass it some key, and it does it for you. Uh, it's so common that they have this function. But it's important to understand the implementation of it, because you might not have access to underscore, and it's, it's, it's so easy and so frequently used that you can just easily implement them both. So we have property. And then we have pluck. So we pass uh, our array and our property we want to map to, and pluck will just call those things for us. Um, I also think it's a great place to use it inside of, uh, if you use D3 a lot, I, I don't know how many times I've seen return just some value, some regular value, or call another function on there. And we'll see more about this compose function in a little bit. Uh, so we have. Uh, we can create a function that actually gets called twice, and uh, we have this get frequency value already, because that's the property we want to pick out uh, as seen here on line nine. And the, the rewritten version uh, will call get frequency, which returns that property, and passes that on to y. So here's composing basics. We have two greetings. We have greeting one, which is some name, and greeting two, and we can, have, we can easily create a new version of, or a new style of function with this by simply creating compose. And we already have access to alert and console.log. And we can just use compose, which will um, return us some new functions that call these from right to left. So greeting one will be called and then alert, or greeting two, et cetera. So in, the, in this case on line 17, we're going to log the first greeting, just pass it, JS community. And in turn, we get returned, uh, welcome to Chicago. And here's a simple implementation of Compose. Uh, so we have this underscore two array, which is equivalent to the slice function we saw before. And then we're gonna return this composed function, um, which actually reduces right this time. So reducing right is just going to go from the end of the array back to the beginning instead of the other way, uh, which is with regular reduce. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of action going on in here. Um, because we're going from the right, we don't wanna iterate over every single value. Um, because our initial value needs to be that very first function that gets called with the arguments we give it. So I'll, I'll try my best to explain how this works. So last is another underscore function that will return the very last value inside of an array. And then we call apply on it and spread the values that were given in this composed call across that function. So in turn, we get this result back. 
as our accumulator. So the result could be, let's imagine uh, we want, oh, actually, sorry. In the case of the greeting, we have, uh, it takes a name. So if we imagine this coming, uh, getting passed in, composed would get name first. And then we could replace this last line here with name instead, or the function call on name instead. And then it goes over the remainder of the functions with those returned values. Oops. Um, I do not have time for that. Sorry. All right, so we're going to talk about a little bit about currying. In this case, um, a curry is a way to accept values and returns uh, a new function with those um, that allows you to. Sorry, let me start over. So, a, a, a way to curry a function, there's a underscore dot curry. And when you give it that value, the ending, the function value will not, or the, the actual function action will not occur until all the parameters are realized. So, in the case, uh, of, of these, we have this katana and a bat, and they all have a swing function, and then we have the actual swing function that accepts one of these uh, items or weapons if you're making a game, and when we call it, we can actually create a swing katana without actually having to duplicate our code. So we just pass it our katana object, which is our item, as seen here, and our bat. So now when we call swing katana, it only needs that last parameter to actually uh, run this function, which in this case is 30. So you can imagine it looking more like this. So if we called function swing, if we created a function swing katana, we pass it an item, and it's going to return us a function that accepts the parameter speed. I'm sorry, I'm going to skip the implementation here. Uh, similar to curry is partial, which only accept, um, you can actually give, that, this is similar to bind as well, um, but it does not um, use context. So we can skip the context. In this case, for launch rocket, it takes a speed, velocity, and an angle, and we're going to call partial on it. And this, in this case, for a rocket, we're always going to have the value 100 used. So maybe we're doing some experimentation um, which values are useful, but rather than passing 100 every time, and maybe there's some refactoring we want to do, we can simply just change a single value so now that we're testing on 200. And the implementation is very similar to bind, uh, whereas we get the remainder of the arguments taken and then call the function. Um, here's a simple example as well. I want to uh, verify that. Sorry, I'm just trying to make this fit on here. There. So we have uh, underscore compose. We're going to combine it with partial to say uh, where is equal takes two values to ensure their equality. So I'm going to partial it with my name and also use underscore property name. So it's going to call underscore property name, pass that return value to is equal, which will compare it to Trevor. So we have a variable here is in fact Trevor. Um, I'll spread the values across. Uh, just to get the first value out, and then uh, we can verify that's me as well. Um, so I'm actually just going to move on to the demo because and there's only a few more left, um, and please look at them later, and I'm going to add a lot more comments after the conference, but I'd like you to see the demo. So the purpose of the demo um, is a simple task list, nothing like to do in VC at all. Um, where we have a, a list of item or list list of lists, I like to call it, or, or list of tasks, uh, and so we can switch between them. We have it that way, and we can edit them, complete them, filter them, etc., and sort. Uh, and this is all used using one array with objects in them. And we can take a quick peek at what that looks like. Uh, oops, sorry. I forgot what the name of it was. Um, so this is actually a React app, by the way. And I have the data somewhere in here.
tasks. Should have known. So as you can see, the, the entire app is just created off this tasks object. And everything is mutated, uh, or sorry, <laughs> transformed uh, to work across it. So this is what an object ends up looking like. We have a complete um, property created, uh, its ID, and the text that shows. And type is refers to what the, um, its list that it belongs to. So without needing to worry about um, the, how React works, this is the start of the app, essentially. And we take in this data, that's some CSV, because that's the best format, um, where the actual text is this fly to moon, and the type it belongs to is space. Oops, sorry. Um, so in this, I don't, the only function I actually create by hand, um, and by hand I mean provides real logic, uh, is this make task function, which creates a, a task. I think I'm going to run out of time, but I will try to get through this. Following that, this is all the properties that we saw before, and I have some other functions, this, but this is it. Using all these functions, I actually um, was able to create an entire application. And I'm not saying this is the way you should do it, but this is just proof of concept that uh, transforming val uh, your values is extremely powerful, and I'm not actually mutating any uh, at all, or even creating new functions. So I have uh, get type, which is a lot of property accessors, and the apply get type is a way for me to actually just pick out the first value inside of arrays. And further, I have some is complete. And I didn't get to talk about this library is, um, which is library, uh, which is a predicate library that I wrote. Um, but with that, I can combine uh, the property complete with uh, is falsy, which will just tell me if this value is complete or not, or if this task has been complete or not. Further, I have um, does this value actually have some text in it? Because it's really naive, and if you create a new task, um, it just suddenly doesn't work. Oh, sorry, I had some filtering. So we get some new tasks here, and I can update them. And in, in turn, uh, I'm able to tell it actually as text by passing it my get text property that's already written, uh, test of what the length is, and ensure that it is in fact positive. So, We have uh, a lot of, the only real functions that have been written around are the ones that handle the events. Sorry, I'm, so the best way to summarize this, because I have about two minutes left, I have no time for questions, is uh, that many of these, many, whenever I create something, I'm actually just getting new values out of it um, by updating them. I frequently use defaults to update that given task, so I don't change that task, because I don't know who's going to be using it elsewhere. And so I just update the completed property in this case when I click the checkbox. And as we can see, we can have, get filtering here. And as you can see, it actually gets updated up top as well. If it stopped jumping. Uh, these values are actually decreasing. Uh, and and, and uh, additionally, when we actually changed or added a value, we just update the text property uh, internally here and pass those values on to be re-rendered by React. Uh, so some other great things um, you should take from this is that you can pass, um, don't forget about passing functions along and don't always try to know about what data is always available to you. So in order for me to do the sorting that I have, I use this comparator function that's available in the underscore contrib library. Um, and, I ca and, I, and then additionally with underscore, I can easily transform data by chaining arguments from that. So when sort is called, I take in the arguments, which will get converted to an array. I map the text values across it. And then I invoke the two lowercase because there is a uh, priority in terms of um, capitalization. And from that, I apply those values across the is less than um, function, which just says is a less than b. But I'm passing this function. I'm not actually, I don't know anything about the list. I just know that um, there's some values in it that are going to be strings. So this ends up getting passed to, 
wherever it is. I went too far. Here it is. So when on sort is called, I just get this comparator back and I update it, the actual state of this object here. So this, this particular component knows about this comparator. And when he renders, all he has to do is call it. So we get our tasks and, and we apply our, our filter sort first, and then we call sort with that comparator. And now he doesn't care, he just knows he's going to get some, some sort of comparator back. I am pretty much done, and I'm not sure if I have to get off of here. But we should definitely look at one more. Um, so in addition to adding new values, this is a very easy one. When we click the new button, all we have to do is call that make task, and I have this new list con uh, constant that uh, we can use that will add the, a new list to it with a empty value, because that's how this, this works. And so when I call that, I have an on change, on add event. I'm sorry. I didn't, where did it go? Okay, so here it is. We get the add task, and all we do is pass it the task. So we have that make task function that's usable everywhere, and just give it a task, and it knows what to do with it. And it gets the active type from it by calling the get type function that we already have available and just concat the task onto it. I do think I'm out of time. I'm sorry I don't have time to finish this, but you know, we can go out after and I'll talk to you all about it and I'll, I'll happily give you a one-on-one -on -one if you want or whatever. Uh, thank you. <laughs>